Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I think we should address the uh, the bright lights in the room. This is glorious. <laughs> For those that are watching at home, I hope this looks really spiffy. <laughs> Try not to stare so closely at our faces. <laughs> um, I think the lights were uh, very much um, uh, desired by the River Life group, and they really pitched it. This is really their thing that they wanted to bring more lights. Then uh, uh, we're like, sure, let's awesome. let's add to our worship service. Yeah. Um, but uh, worship for us is not just people up front; it's the whole church, right? Mm -hmm. And so we like to shine this back on you. <laughs> <laughs> it makes it harder to see everybody, uh, but we know that you're there. But, but it's good to see everyone here. Yes. Uh, uh, you guys came a lot earlier while we were still practicing. We're like, ah, uh, jo come join our practice session. <laughs> um, we uh, Just a couple of announcements. I know uh, some of them go on, on the slides up here, and you know them in the newsletter. I just want to highlight a few things. Number one, we the Matokas uh, have a baby boy, Jason. Yay. Um, congratulations. congratulations to Ben, Irene, and Zoe. Uh, very excited for them to uh, have an addition to their family. Um, and we haven't seen them, and so it's yeah. just kind of uh, hard to be so dis you know, disconnected. But if you're online, we've been thinking of you. We wish you well. Um, we uh, also want to lift up all uh, those who are hurting in our society. It doesn't stop, does it? I mean, every, every week there is bad news, not just in the world, in our uh, personal uh, church family, um, our hearts go out to the Rutkowskis. You know, we've been praying for Carmela, um, Randy's sister-in-law, for a long time, and she passed away this last week. So, um, prayers for the family. Um, we uh, we thank God that we live in a land that we can worship freely. Amen. Um, just any opportunity to get together and worship God is, I think, a blessing. Um, and to praise God for life. Um, sometimes, you know, we forget the, the simple th uh, things, the simple joys. And um, when you see other people in the other side of the world just struggling to survive, it's heartbreaking, just heartbreaking, you know. Um, our hearts go with them, um, our, our extended church family there. Mm -hmm. um, I did want to highlight some birthdays. We had, we had a big birthday this week for Esther. She turned 27 Yay! again. Yay! <laughs> uh, but um, she is a big part of our church, and she is such a blessing. Um, and so and we are Dex. so grateful. Mm -hmm. Pastor Dex. Pastor Dex. Yes. yes. Had a birthday this week. Yep. Wow. Yep. Pastor Dex. Yay! He he turned 30. <laughs> <laughs> We get younger here in this church. <laughs> Everybody, everybody's below 40. <laughs> um, yes, Caitlin. Um, I, there is one person who's over 40. She's walking down the way here. My mom is turning 75 this Monday. So Yay. I just want to highlight. Birthday, she looks pretty good for 75, yeah. I think. So she's <laughs> turning 35 this, this Monday. So. But uh, as uh, we bow our heads, let's, uh, let's invite the Spirit to worship with us and bring us uh, closer to Christ today. Uh, dear Jesus, uh, thank you for this time. Uh, sometimes we are so used to um, being by ourselves, actually, in this pandemic. Uh, it's easy to just be at home. <laughs> Um, and uh, not want to meet other people, uh, but I, I thank you for the opportunity to get together as fellow believers, Lord. There is power in prayer. I believe it. There's power in community. There's power in our fellowship, Lord. Each one here, they have different things that they're going through, Lord. Uh, we ask that you draw near to them. Um, be with us in our worship service that we grow closer to you and each other is our prayer. Amen.
Because sometimes you go through the, the week and you are so burdened with various things. And Amen. for a moment, if we could all just lay it down on the cross, trade it for the joy of the Lord. Um, we want to invite you to stand up and sing with us. I hope you're standing at home as well. Please stand at home.
It's always comforting to know you can trade your sorrows at any time and receive that joy of the Lord that never seems to run out. You are home. 
to your arms the riches of your love will always be Are you guys ready for a new song? <laughs> Always. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we still serve the same God who can move mountains. Um, and sometimes it's hard to believe that. Uh, this song is about that. So the mountain in your life, the mountain in the world, um, we pray that God opens doors. The song is called Believe For It. Ah, there we go.
powerful I, song. I love that line in the first verse. They don't know you like we do. Mm. We, we have that faith. Yeah. We know what God can do in our lives. And sometimes when there are mountains in front of us, challenges, they are discouraging, yes. But we know what God can do. Yes. Amen. Amen. Um, we want to encourage you to share any praises, any prayer requests um, with uh, our community here. And Leslie looks like Leslie has the mic. Um, if anyone has a word to share, of course, again, I will lift up the Rakowski family um, as uh, they've been hit really hard in the last few months here. A yes. lot of tragedy in their family. So, um, Randy, Terry, um, Amy, Jason, you know, we keep them in our prayers and lift them up. Dex, is there anything online? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah Afghanistan is just such a... The images coming out of Afghanistan are just absolutely heartbreaking. Um, not only just the people there that are um, hoping for freedom, but the Christians that are there. One yeah. of the fastest countries for Christ, the Christian movement. And they're all fearing for their lives right now. Hmm. We'll have Dex uh, come up and pray. Let us pray. Dear Father, as we come to you today, Lord, you have heard our request. You've heard our heart, our mind. You have felt our pain, Lord, our sadness. You felt our sorrows, Lord, our mourning. You've also felt our joy, Lord. You have felt our praise today. You have felt us, Lord. You know our frames, Lord. Uh, we're so thankful, Lord God, that you know us. We're so thankful, God, that we know you. Amen. We come here, Lord, lifting up the prayer requests, Lord, that have been mentioned. Pray for Randy and Terry and Amy and David and Jason and his wife. We pray for Randy's brother, Lord, who lost his dear Carmela this week. We pray, Lord, in heaven that you will provide what they need, Lord. You know. You know better than we do, Lord. We just, we just mention their name and bring them to you today, Lord. We pray, Lord, for the devastation, Lord, in Haiti. The earthquakes, the rain, the assassination of the president. So much turmoil, Lord. Our hearts go out to the people there, Lord. Our hearts go out to the people in Afghanistan, Lord. Our hearts are broken, Lord. We look at the images, Lord. People wanting to leave the country, Lord, who are wanting to get on airplanes. We see, Lord, and hear the persecution of your followers, the Christians there, Lord. We see the suffering, Lord, of people who don't think like the Taliban, who have taken over, who have a different point of view, Lord, and the suffering that so many people are going through in that country. We pray, Lord, for our country. We pray for our community. We pray for the challenges, Lord, that young people face today in a world, Lord, that is so complicated, so troubling, Lord, and trying to navigate that world. We pray for our young families, Lord, as they raise their children in this world that we live in today, Lord. We pray for our church members, Lord. We pray for unspoken prayer request. We pray, Lord, for the COVID-19 situation in this country, Lord, and around the world. 
pandemic is not behind us, it's staring us straight in our faces, Lord. We pray, Lord, for our country. Pray for all of the leaders, Lord, locally, statewide, Lord, federally. We pray, Lord, for our churches, that we would be light, Lord, in a world where there's so much strife, where there's so much pain, where there's so much struggle, Lord. We just come before you, Lord, and we bring ourselves, Lord. We bring ourselves. We're needy. We're broken. We're imperfect, Lord. We have our own struggles and challenges, and so we bring ourselves before your throne today. We thank you, Lord, that we can be here together as a community, as has already been said earlier, Lord. We come as a community, Lord. We come, Lord, to worship you. We come, Lord, to give you our burdens. We come, Lord, to give you our heart, our soul, our mind, our bodies. We come here, Lord, prostrate before you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you are a prayer-hearing God. We thank you, Father. We pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
So kids, it is time for children's story. And then after children's story, Emily is going to be doing a special music for us on the piano. Yay! The kids, come on up. Start collecting any tithe or offering that you see that the grown-ups have. Come on up for children's story. jazzy that jazzy music yes thank you oh do we find everything hmm do we find i still see money in hands here we go i'm picking it up picking it up there we go reaching 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 oh 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 i think there's still is there still some more oh oh there we go oh ethan's got some shake it shake it shake it shake it shake it shake it can you reach there we go thank you Wow, solid work, everybody. Look at that. That is a great, great job. Oh, wait, we are farther farther back than I realized we were. Okay. Oh, ah, oh, ah. There. there we go. All right. Now, I got a question. Who's gone back to school? I think I asked this since I have a school. But let's see. Let's see some hands. Okay. Or if you've gone back to school, gone back to preschool. Back to the usual routines, yeah. Oh boy, okay, well, oh, hold on, hold on. This is very hard to do while holding the microphone. <laughs> come on, buddy, come on. There we go, woo, woo, okay. It's gotta, gotta wiggle it out. Okay, first, who lives in the corner of the Cameron family garage? It's Murray! And what's Murray's favorite thing to do in the whole wide world? Up and up and up and up and up because he is a grasshopper, right? Because he's a grasshopper. Now, we talked last week. Last week, Murray went to, he went to school. He went to grasshopper school. Remember the story? He got on the bus and zooming around. A grasshopper bus, right? A grasshopper bus that sort of zoomed and hopped at the same time. And when he got to school, he met a new friend named. I was hoping someone would remember. Hopper! Hopper! And he made his new little friend. All right. Well, one day at school, Hopper and Murray were very excited because after lunchtime, they were going to go out onto the playground. And they were so excited. They could see the playground out their classroom window. And it looked like an awesome playground. What's your favorite thing at a playground? Okay, Clara likes swings. Who likes swings? Raise your hand. Oh, excellent. I don't like swings. That's funny. Okay, who, what else? Who else? What's another favorite thing on the playground? Um, I, I like the, all the climbing stuff. You like climbing things. Who likes that? Raise your hand. Oh, fantastic. Great. Okay, what else? What else is a favorite? Yes, Chelsea. The slide. Uh, the slide is my favorite part. I love, oh, uh, I love the slide. I love the slide, too. It's my favorite part on a playground. Avery, do you have a favorite thing on the playground, or you just like the slide? I can't hear you. The monkey bars. Ooh, who's, who's got, who can do the monkey bars? I find the monkey bars extremely challenging. I get blisters very quickly. Okay, so Murray is looking out the window, and he thinks the new playground at his grasshopper school looks very exciting, and he cannot wait to go out there. And Hopper whispers and goes, I can't wait to go, I can't wait to go. And then pretty soon, their grasshopper teacher says, you can go outside to the playground. Whee! And all the little grasshoppers in the class went doing, 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 and went out to the playground. Now, remember, this is a grasshopper school. And what is, what's the favorite thing for grasshoppers to do? Hop and hop and hop. That's what I was thinking, that at a grasshopper school on the playground, grasshoppers have trampolines because they like to hop. 
And so they get onto the trampoline. Now, because there's a grasshopper school and a lot of them like to hop, there are many trampolines. So not everybody's all on one trampoline. But Murray and his new buddy Hopper go hopping on over to a trampoline and they start to bounce around, bouncing, 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 bouncing. And Murray is like, hey, watch me, Hopper. It does like these cool little tricks, spins, flips, and all kinds of things. And Hopper goes, oh, I can't do that. I can't do it. I'm going to try. I'm going to try. And Hopper tries. Uh, splat. Lands on her tummy. Oh, I can't do that. And Murray says, it's okay. Here, I'll try. I'll show you. I'll show you. Doing, doing. Ah! Gong, doing. See? See, it's easy, Hopper. And Hopper tries again. Doing. Uh, splat. No, I can't do it. Now, have you ever had a hard time doing something on the playground? I'm thinking of the monkey bars specifically. Those I feel like you can't do right as soon as you get on the playground. You have to like practice, right? But then you might see an older kid on the playground doing the monkey bars, like lickety split, like you're like, oh, I wish I could do that. And you try and then you fall. Or your hands start to hurt. You're like, oh, I'll never get to do the monkey bars. Oh, that would be, yeah, that would be funny if Murray was doing monkey bars. As a fireman's pole. That is very cool. Okay, so that here's Murray. Here's Murray here who can do all these cool tricks on the grasshopper trampoline on the playground. But his new friend Hopper cannot. Now, have you ever seen a friend that has a hard time doing something? Now, what's your typical mode? Murray, can you hold my microphone for me? Okay, thank you. What's your typical mode? Do you go, ha, ha, you can't do that. I can. Do you do that? Oh, I would hope you wouldn't. I would hope you wouldn't, because I know all of you, and you are all so very kind, and I don't think you would do that at all. And so do you think that's what Murray did? Ha, ha, Hopper, you can't do that. I can't. I'm better on the trampoline than you are. No, not at all. Murray said, try again, Hopper. And Hopper tried again. Bouncy, bouncy, tried to do the flip, splat. Said, oh, this is so hard. And so Murray said, that's okay. We don't have to do cool tricks. Let's just jump and see how high we can jump instead. Hopper said, that's a great idea, Murray. And they jumped to see who could jump the highest. And they had so much fun on the playground. You see, Murray, he could have teased, right? He could have made fun. Could have said, you can't do that right? But is that, is that kind? Is that how God wants us to treat our friends like that? No way, Jose, right? Okay, so we last week we learned a memory verse. I'll, I'll come down. Okay, we'll remember it was from Galatians 6, 10, and it goes like this. Let us, you can go ahead and point to yourself. Let us do good for everyone. Everyone. Let's try it again. Ready? Let us do good for everyone. That's right. And I think that's exactly what Murray did with his friend Hopper. He showed goodness and kindness, right, to his friend Hopper by encouraging but then saying, hey, let's do something else fun. That could be fun too, right? All right. So I want you, as you go about going to school, maybe going to the library, going to the playground, whatever it is that you've got going on right now, I want you to remember to do good for everyone that you're around, all right? And I know you can because you all love God. And I know, I know how kind you all can be, all right? Well, you can go back to your seats now, and next week we'll learn another Murray story at school. Goodbye, 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 goodbye.
Emily, that was beautiful. That was beautiful. That was so um, just, just can't even put the words to it. It was just so beautiful. <laughs> it was just, I was just delighting in that as I was listening to that and just, um, just receiving what Emily has shared with us today. Just receiving it. Just taking it in. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Esther. <laughs> What a blessing. How's everybody doing today? Are we okay? Yeah, good. Hanging in there? It's good to be with you all, as always. I love this congregation. I love the beautiful faces. I love the diversity. I love the love that's here. I thank God for each and every one of you. God is good. God is good. I've been preaching a series uh, from First Thessalonians called A Church in Waiting. A Church in Waiting, because, you know, that early church, this letter that Paul wrote to this church around 51 A.D. was a church that was a church in waiting. They believed that the Lord Jesus Christ was coming in their lifetime. And as we'll see later on when we get to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, some of the believers in Christ had started dying, and they wondered what was going on. And so Paul had to write them a letter of encouragement. It's really what it was. It's a very pastoral letter. It's a very encouraging letter. It's different than, say, the book of Romans, which is a very theological, very dense book, um, one of the great uh, books about the salvation that we have in Christ. But it's really a pastoral letter is what the book of 1 Thessalonians really is. And um, last, last week I talked about the transforming God, and, I, and, I, and what I talked about is how Paul wanted to make sure that the Thessalonians knew that Paul was giving them the essence of what faith was about, and that was the gospel of 
of God. And Paul says, we're not giving this by trickery. We're not doing this to make a living. We're not doing this to get over on you. But we are giving you all of, all of us to share this message with you that God has called me as an apostle to give to you. And then the other thing Paul modeled, you know, he modeled loving. He modeled loving the Thessalonians. He, he described himself as being a child and, and really saying, I've, I've come humbly before you to give this message. He describes himself as a child. He describes himself as a mother, which is very interesting. And he describes himself as a father. He says, I loved on you. I loved on you. And I think it's important for us to remember that Paul's loving on the Thessalonians was very important because these people were new in Christ, and there were not a lot of people who were followers of Jesus in Thessalonica. And perhaps as these people came into the fold, as they came into knowing Christ, their family members deserted them, perhaps. Because that's a big move. They may have been following the religions of, you know, of their parents, and now they tell their parents they're no longer uh, following that. They are now followers of this new religion, because it was a new religion. It was a new religion in the Roman Empire. I want you to understand that. It was a new religion. Now, many people see Christianity as a, cont a continuation of Judaism. You know, uh, it's a continuation of Judaism, but not everybody sees it that way. But what is interesting is that Paul loves on them very hard, very hard. And I think there's a lesson in it for us, for us to love hard on one another, especially those who are new in Christ. Amen? to love hard on those who are new in Christ. Today, I want to talk about receiving the word, receiving the word. And I'm going to be looking at 1 Thessalonians. I'm going to be looking at chapter uh, 2 in 1 Thessalonians. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, I'd like to, to read that to you. I'd like to say that this, this, is, a, this is a very challenging um, piece of Scripture. And you're going to find out what I mean when I get to the part that's really challenging. Very, very challenging. And, you know, a lot of people have struggled with this. Uh, preachers, theologians, uh, it's a very tough passage of Scripture. But we're not there yet. Well, we're not there yet, but we'll get to it. And um, I'm reading here from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting at verse 13. And I'm reading from the New International Version. And Paul writes to the church there at the Thessalonica, and we also thank God continually because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. Word of God, I said, equals acceptance of the gospel. In you who believe, let's see there. Yeah, and then it should have verses 14. Let me just uh, grab my Bible here because it should have 14, 15, and 16. But, so in 1 Thessalonians chapter 13, and then I'm going to go on to uh, 14 and 15. So it goes on to say, For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people, the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus. And the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last." Some of that's some hard text there. I don't know if you've got that. You know, this is one of those, those, this is one of these Bible texts that you don't want to really preach on. <laughs> You'd rather avoid preaching on it if there's any way you can avoid it, but you know the word is there and you've got to preach it. <laughs> so you have to look it square in the eyes. You have to look it square in the eyes, but um, we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, we're gonna navigate through it. We're going to struggle through it a little bit. I can tell you right now, it's not easy. But Paul writes this letter to the Thessalon Thessalonians. And Paul says he's always giving thanks to the church at, Thess at Thessalonica. And this is the, 
Second time that Paul says that, that he gives thanks, because he's always giving thanks. Paul's always got thanks on his lips. That comes out of his heart. That's what rings out of Paul. And he gives thanks to the Thessalonians uh, back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 when he says he thanks them, he thanks God for the Thessalonians. And now in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13, he thanks God for the Thessalonians because they have what? They have received the word. They have received the word. They have received the gospel of Jesus Christ. He thanks God that they have received the word. It is a word from God about the resurrected Jesus who has conquered death and who now lives forever to impart his righteousness and grace to imperfect people, which we all are. Amen? He imparts that grace. He preaches that gospel, and they accept it. It is delivering all humanity from the penalty of sin. Or you could say, as Paul says in his letter, the wrath of God. It's not a term that we easily connect to in the 21st century. But he talks about it delivers them from the penalty of death, the wrath of God. He is so joyful that they have accepted Jesus. Jesus defeats the judgment of sin that we are all worthy of death. We're all worthy of the penalty of death. And Paul is happy that they have accepted the gospel. Furthermore, Paul gives thanks because it's nothing that he can do. It's nothing that he does in his own power to move the people to accept Jesus. It is the Holy Spirit, which Paul refers to earlier in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul has understood what it means in his own experience to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul knew in his own experience Paul had received Jesus and understood that his righteousness meant nothing. He understood that God's righteousness was a healing medicine. He, that's what Paul understood, that God's righteousness is a healing medicine. It is a restorative medicine. It is a rejuvenating medicine. It is a redemptive medicine. It is a reinvigorating medicine. For Paul, it was knowing that he was loved by God despite his imperfections. That was the message of the gospel, despite his sin, despite his wretchedness. Paul said, what a wretched man I am. He said, who will set me free? And he ends up saying, it's Jesus Christ the righteous. Paul recognized his condition. He says in Romans 7, 25, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul is thankful that the Thessalonians have received this same Jesus that he has received. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14, in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, it seems to take a really weird turn. All of a sudden, you're reading about Paul thanking God uh, for them receiving Jesus Christ, and he's saying all these effusive, very glowing things, and then all of a sudden there is a turn in the letter. It takes an unexpected tone. It's surprising, really, from the content of the letter that we have been reading thus far. The letter takes a 180-degree turn, and I want to read to you the passage in your hearing, and I want you to sit with it for a minute. This is a passage that you have to sit with because it's a, it's a, very, it's a very challenging passage. He says, For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus, you suffered from your own people the same. Now get this, you suffer from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. Just sit with that and think about reading that text. Imagine going and telling people that Jews are Christ killers. Let's see how we can work through this passage of Scripture. It's a tough passage, and it doesn't take much self-awareness to realize that when you read it, I want you to think about this passage, how this passage hits you in the 21st century. One of the things that Paul does right off the bat is commend the Thessalonians in imitating the churches in Judea. He does that. Who have experienced suffering like you have from your own people, uh, the Jews in Judea. And he's talking about a very specific group of people. He's not talking about the Jews 
in general, the big, you know, the big nation, but he's talking about a very specific group of people. In this case of the Judean church, it's a group of people. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 14 that about their suffering. The interesting thing about a passage like this, and we have, to, we have to handle a passage like this very, very carefully. You have to handle passages like this very, very carefully. And the reason you have to handle a passage like this very, very carefully, I don't know if you ever go on the Internet and you look up militia groups. You look up Christian identity theology. And these militia movements that we have here in America, these Christian identity theology, they use the Bible and the Bible has often been used, you have to understand, to promote slavery, <laughs> to support the subordination of women, to use anti-Semitism against people who are Jewish. The Bible has been used, I would say it's been misused. <laughs> I want you to understand that the Bible has been misused because I don't believe the Bible teaches that. Because if you read Paul, he doesn't teach that. If you read Paul closely, he doesn't teach that. He doesn't teach the marginalization of women. He doesn't teach the mar marginalization of people of, of color. He says we're all in Christ. <laughs> he says there's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither Greek nor Jew. There's neither slave nor free, for we're all one in Christ. But there are people who use Bible verses like this one to marginalize people and to hate on people. So we have to be very careful about how we handle this. Now, in reading this week, I probably read close to, I don't know, 10 commentaries on different people's take on this passage of Scripture. Because I was twisting in the wind thinking about it. And it's interesting some of the responses of those who've looked at it. And some say, they use a word called interpolation. Interpolation. Because many people have looked at this passage of Scripture, and it is a very dizzying trying to understand and preach on this text. Some Bible scholars have thought that the passage of Scripture is an interpolation, meaning that Paul did not originally write this. That this was not originally written by Paul, but it was inserted later on by some other writer, some other scribe. And interpolation is defined as inserting words into the Bible text that weren't originally there. I want to give you an example of an interpolation. I'm going to give you an example of an interpolation. And it's one that we're all very familiar with, and it's the story of the woman caught in adultery. Do you know that's an interpolation? That was not in the original text. Now, we, I want you to know this, too. We don't have the original text of the Old Testament or the New Testament. What we have is copies of copies of copies of copies. And there are many manuscripts of both the Old and the New Testament. But in the earliest manuscripts that they have, there is no story of the woman caught in adultery. That's called an interpolation. And if you, as a matter of fact, I pick up my Bible, and it's interesting in this Bible here, this is the New International Version, and I want to read to you what it says in, this, in John chapter 8. I want to read to you what it says. In John chapter 8, as a matter of fact, it starts at John chapter 7, verse 53 through John chapter 8, verse 11, here's what it says. I'm going to read to you what it says. And it may say that in your Bible if you open it. It says, The earliest manuscripts and many other ancient witnesses do not have John chapter 7, verses 53 through verses 8, chapter 8, verse 11. A few manuscripts include these verses. Holy are in part after John 7, verse 36, John chapter 21, verse 25, Luke chapter 21, verse 38, or Luke chapter 24, verse 53. So what it's telling us is the earliest manuscripts do not have the story of the woman caught in adultery. That's a story that's inserted later on, but what is believed is that there was somebody who was familiar with the story who said this story was not included, this story is, should be part of the Gospel of John. And the translators and the people who have managed and handled our scriptures for, you know, for a long time, and, and I'm always grateful for the people who've handled the text, who preserved the text, that this is part of the story of the Gospel of John. And they included it. That's called an interpolation. And the story rings true to the Gospel of John. If you read the Gospel of John, it fits and it flows very well with the Gospel of John. I want to give you another example of an interpolation. And this is one that I referred to last week. And it's uh, it, it, where in the writing of, 
of the letter to the, in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes that women are not to speak in church. Women are not to speak in church, Paul writes. But if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and you read all the stuff before it, <laughs> you read all the stuff around it, he's telling everybody, both men and women, <laughs> to bring your hymns to church, to share something. He's not just talking to men, but he's talking to men and women. Many Bible scholars believe that this is what you call an interpol interpolation. Now, when they go back in the manuscripts, I was reading Richard B. Hayes, who is a professor at Duke University, teaches in the School of Divinity there. And in his, and in his um, comments, what he said was, if you go back to the earliest manuscripts, you will see that that passage is there. But the thing is, we don't have all the original manuscripts from the beginning, so at some point, many scholars believe that was an insertion later on, what we call an interpolation that came into the passage that does not fit what Paul writes. It does not fit, but what I'm saying is sometimes people take stuff like that and they use it in a way that's destructive, uh, that marginalizes people. It's interesting. It's, 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 a, it's a very challenging, it's, this is a very challenging thing because we don't talk often very much about interpolation in church. Now, when we come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 16, we ask the question, is that an interpolation? Because all of a sudden, Paul is writing one way, and then he ends up writing another way. So let me ask you this question. Let's read this. Let's, let's think about this. Was it an interpolation that would be an easy way out of this challenging verse? As many scholars recognize and acknowledge in almost any commentary that you will read about some other things that what they call interpolations. Esteemed Bible scholars have come down on both. I want you to know, esteemed scholars have come down on both sides of the divide. Some say that 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 16 is an interpolation, that it was added later. Others say that it is not. The bottom line, folks, this is a challenging Bible text. So what do we do with the passage that seems to lay the death of Jesus at the foot of Jews? What do we do with that? It is a passage that sounds very anti-Semitic. Let's be honest about it. Of course, Paul was living in the first century. Let's be honest about that, right? Because sometimes we take and impose first century ideas. On, we try to read the first century through our lens, the 21st century. Especially the part where it says that the Jews killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. And of course, we know the history of Israel. Sometimes they did give the prophets a hard time. That is true. I could have actually skipped this part of the letter and kept right on moving. I tell you the truth. I could have easily done that. And he would say, well, he didn't preach on that. He skipped that. But this gives us something to wrestle with and to think deeply about. And we, and we must remember that the early members of the church were Jewish. That's the thing we have to remember. Paul was a Jew. Let's not forget that. The early followers of the Christian church were what? Jewish. In the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost, who were there? They were Jewish people. So what is Paul saying? What is Paul saying? Paul had some very hard words for his fellow Jews, and I would imagine that Paul never imagined, by the way, that we would be reading his letter today. Paul would have never imagined that we would be reading his letter today 20 centuries later in the 21st century. As a matter of fact, Paul would have no idea that people would be sitting in a church at 510 Sage Road in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, or any other church almost 2,000 years later reading his letter. I think we might consider reading this section of the letter through the lens of his fierce urgency. That's the lens I think we have to read the, 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 it through. We have to read it through the lens of the fierce urgency of Paul wanting the new churches to run smoothly because he says that these Jews were causing trouble, and a fierce urgency for his fellow Jews to know the Jesus that he met. Paul could come across, by the way, very dogmatically. Paul could have used hyperbole. Paul could exaggerate. You read somewhere where Paul says, I would give to have torn up my eyes if you would have believed. Paul could be bold in the way he spoke. I think early on in myself, you, how much I wanted my parents to join the church that I belonged to. And I can remember how dogmatic I was. I had learned the truth. I had learned the word of God. I had, been I had received Jesus and had been baptized. And I wanted my parents to have that same experience. I wanted them to know that Jesus that I knew. And I can remember how dogmatic and maybe how inarticulate I was and how poorly I framed some of my language when I was trying to communicate to them. 
And I can tell you, it wasn't effective. <laughs> and I think sometimes we have to remember the Word of God is inspired, but God uses human instruments. We believe that in our faith tradition, that God uses human instruments. And Paul is trying to articulate what's in his mind the best he can. He's doing the best he can. He's a human being. Let us not forget that. As he tries to articulate and communicate uh, what is going on with the church there. Paul is writing this section of this letter. is very polemical and critical. And you have to ask yourself, does Paul remember what he was like? Does Paul remember who he was? Does Paul remember how he treated the church? Does Paul remember how he persecuted the new believers in Christ? I think that Paul could possibly have been projecting himself. I want you to get this. Paul could possibly have been projecting himself into these Jews that he heard were interfering with the message. Could Paul have been thinking about himself and his own actions at one time and how he treated the church? What was Paul thinking when he spoke? Maybe Paul saw himself. Another aspect of this letter in referring to, the, to his fellow Jews is what is called insider language. You know, insiders speak a certain language when they're together. You know, if you're from this country, you know what I'm talking about, yes. Uh, if you're from this country, you know, people who are from Kenya, they meet and they speak a certain language. Jose used to watch a, um, a comedian named, what was his name, Oliver? He was Oliver. I was he Jamaican. I forgot where he's from. But Oliver, you know, I remember when I first met Jose, and, you know, Jose's West Indian, and I'm surrounded by all these West Indian people, and, you know, they're watching this television show, and this comedian, he's very famous. You can look him up. He's a Jamaican comedian. His name is Oliver. And Oliver would be telling these inside jokes. I'm like, what in the world? Everyone's laughing. I'm the only one sitting up there not laughing. Everyone's laughing. I don't know what they're laughing about, but they get the insider language. They get the insider message that Oliver is conveying. And I feel in some ways when Paul is speaking, he's speaking insider language. To us, it sounds inflammatory, but he's speaking insider language. He's trying, I, I, I think that when they read this letter, this is not a letter that just stays with the Thessalonians. I think this is a letter where people go out and gossip. <laughs> They read the letter and they go out and talk, gossip and they talk about it. People hear about what Paul wrote. He shares the message. He's obviously, I think, not only trying to communicate to the Thessalonians, but maybe he's trying to communicate to his fellow, his fellow Jews. Maybe that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to let them know that he cares about them. He's talking to his homies. He's talking to his homies. Remember, Paul did not accept the gospel himself, and he did everything he could to stop it. You've got to remember that. And I think that Paul, when he wrote this letter, don't think that Paul isn't thinking about himself. How can you write a letter and be so unaware of how you were yourself when you persecuted the church and you tried to stop the message of the gospel from being preached? We're told that Paul was at the stoning of Stephen and that he himself persecuted the church. And then he met and heard the voice. <laughs> he heard the voice. Why, Paul, do you persecute me? Why do you kick against the goads? I believe that Paul must have remembered his own actions. I know that Paul had to remember that he had problems himself with Jesus as Messiah. Did he remember? I ask myself the question. Paul, I believe, is burning with such a deep desire. He's burning with a deep desire to see his family, his family, his Jewish brothers and sisters except Jesus, the Jesus that he has come to know. And the rhetoric that he uses, I believe, is a cry for them to know that Jesus. And in his writing style, I, I believe is a reflection of that. It's a writing style of urgency in his words. And what is so interesting about it, it's just in that little short part that he says these things. Paul wants his own people to escape the, the, escape the term that he uses in the letter, the wrath of God, or I'd like to say God's final judgment. Paul desires that his fellow Israelites are saved. He wants his Jewish compatriots to know and believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Paul does not want his fellow Jews to miss out on this Jesus. But I want, to tell, want you to know that Paul felt this way about the Gentiles as well. I want you to get this. It wasn't just the Jews that Paul wanted to see, be, see saved. Paul also wanted the Gentiles. He had that same passion for the Gentiles. Well, he did not 
He did not want any of them to miss out on Jesus. He wanted them to be spared of God's judgment of sin. Paul calls it wrath. And we believe that one day this world will not always exist. We live in a world with so much suffering. We've been talking about it this morning in our prayer time with so much suffering in Haiti, earthquakes, storms, assassination of the president, People are in poverty in Afghanistan, the persecution of those who are followers in Christ, people fearing for their lives, trying to get out, pandemics with COVID-19, all kinds of things happening. And we believe that there is a better world coming, and Paul wanted his compatriots to experience this better world. That is what Paul is trying to communicate. Paul is not an anti-Semite. He is Jewish. The early followers of the Christian church, they were Jewish. The Old Testament prophets, they were Jewish. It's from the Old Testament we understand the prophecies of Jesus. Paul is not anti-Semite. He pours out his heart for the salvation of the world for both Jews and Gentiles. I want to read this to you. And um, Yes, in 1, Thessalonians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1, what Paul writes. Listen to this. He's writing. He's writing. Paul's struggling. You know, being a, being a preacher isn't easy. Being an apostle isn't easy. You know, Paul preaches in Acts chapter 17. He preaches at the Areopagus. He tells people like Jesus, they say, we want to hear this strange doctrine, this strange new doctrine that you talk about. Paul preaches at the Areopagus, and at the end of chapter 17, he said a few people became followers. <laughs> a few people, not many. Had a bad evangelistic meeting. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 22 to 24, Jews demand signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. A st- get this, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. So he's not only struggling with Jews, trying to communicate the message, he's struggling with Gentiles. But to those who Christ has called, both Jews and Greeks, get this, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Paul. Paul wears his heart on his sleeve, folks. You've met people who wear their heart on their sleeve. (laughs) You met them. They they can't restrain. They're going to tell you what they think and what they feel. Paul was that kind of person. Although some claim that he wasn't that he wasn't like that in person. You know, he said in his letters, he writes weighty things. He speaks pompously and bold, but in person he's a chump. He he's afraid. But Paul wrote boldly. He said, here's, look, listen to this here, what he writes to the church. In, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, he says, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. Could you imagine if I got up and told you this morning, New Life Fellowship, I cannot address you as spiritual, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. Could you imagine me saying that today? No, but Paul wrote that in the 21st century to the church at Corinth. He says, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready to, you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready for it. (laughs) You're still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? Imagine a sermon like that here at New Life Fellowship. They said, we're ready for him to leave now. I am drawn to some words that Paul writes, and I'm going to read this to you. Because Paul really believed in his people. He believed in the Jewish people. He himself was Jewish. He had heard the message of the Messiah. He had read the, he read the Old Testament lens Christologically. 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 In other words, when he read the, 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 the Old Testament... He read it looking through the lens of Jesus. And by looking at it through the lens of Jesus, he was able to understand how the Old Testament pointed to Jesus. He read it through the lens of Jesus. And I want to read to you what Paul writes in Romans chapter 11, verse 11. He says, he's talking about the Jews. I'm going to ask you a question. He says, again, I ask, uh, did they, the Jews, stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, Salvation has come to the Gentiles, get this, to make Israel envious. I need to move it? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, that's okay. (laughs) That's okay. To make Israel envious. 
And I believe in his letter, he writes to the first Thessalonians, it's there to make the Jewish people envious, those small group of people. This was the small group of Jews. He says, but if their richness, in verse 12, but if their richness, if their richness, but if, uh, but if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? Paul believed that the Jews were going to come in and accept the Messiah. I am talking to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry. Then I'm going to go ahead and read some other stuff that I didn't put down in the hope that I may somehow arise my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but the life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. Because out of Judaism comes Christianity. Out of Judaism comes our faith. Out of Judaism comes Jesus, who was Jewish. So Paul couldn't have been hating on his own people. Heaven forbid, he was not. He was not. And I want to share with you this text in Romans 11, verse 25. He says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Listen to this. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. And he will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. You know, as Adventists, as in our faith tradition, we always call ourselves spiritual Israel. We refer to ourselves as spiritual Israel. But I want you to know there is still an Israel. <laughs> I want you to know there's still a people. As a matter of fact, HMS, I don't know how many of you all know who HMS Richards is. Because the further we get away from those that uh, he's been dead a number of years. But when I was a theology student at Loma Linda University, we had a winter retreat. And he was still living. And he came and spoke to us. And it was very inspiring. Uh, to hear him talk. Uh, he was very invigorating and motivating. But one of the things that HMS Richards believed, he believed that literal Israel, literal Israel, I want you to get this, not all Adventist scholars believe this, not all Adventist preachers believe this, but he believed that God was going to call sp uh, literal Israel into his kingdom. He believed that Romans 11 in those verses spoke to the, children, the people of Israel. And I, I, think, I think that is so fascinating. And I still believe that God is calling people, all people, all people, to, to come to his son Jesus. I mean, if I didn't, I wouldn't be a believer. If I didn't, I wouldn't be a follower of Jesus. If I didn't, I wouldn't be a part of the church. Paul believes that Jesus is the answer for the Gentiles in Thessalonica. And Paul also believes that Jesus is the answer to his fellow Jews. Paul wants his fellow Jewish brothers and sisters to get Jesus. This is Paul's hope for everyone, both Jew and Gentile, alike to receive the word, to believe the word, to accept the word, to accept the gospel and the message of God's love in Jesus Christ as the healing medicine, as the healing medicine that we all need in recognizing that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Paul wants us to have that healing medicine, that gospel of Jesus Christ that can make us whole and cleanse us from our unrighteousness and allow us to stand in relationship with our Jesus. Amen. Thanks, Dex, for tackling that hard message um, and reminding us how, unfortunately, how easily the Bible has been, the Holy Word has been misused hmm. and people have had a skewed view of Christians, right? And even more a prayer for us um, that Christ be in us in all our interactions. We might be the only Jesus people see. Mm -hmm. um, this song is... Uh, we sang this the last two weeks, and what I've loved about it is something that you can carry out throughout the week. May Christ be all around me. 
that when Jesus, uh, when people see us, they really truly see the Christ that we know. That would be our prayer. Let's stand as we sing our last song together.
Father God, we want to thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, and that his death is for everyone, Lord, for Amen. each one of us, Lord. Uh, may we be your hands and feet to all those we come into contact, is our prayer. Amen. 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 Your life, your death, your blood was shed.